Hi, I'm Andy, and although my accent doesn't sound like it, I'm actually from Ireland. In Ireland, people drink a lot of tea. According to my incredibly scientific and meticulously thorough research, the average Irish person drinks around five cups of tea per day. That's approximately 300 liters of tea per year. In fact, we are actually the second biggest tea drinkers in the world. An Irish cup of tea is far more than just a hot drink to go along with your chocolate digestive. Mm -hmm. It's a symbol of family, friendship, and hospitality. I mean, what situation is not made better with a nice cup of tea? Trick question. Every situation is made better with tea. Feeling tired? Cup of tea. Feeling stressed? Cup of tea. Hanging out with friends? Cup of tea. Got rejected by your crush? Cup of tea. On your wedding night? Wait, what? No, seriously. Look. Cup of tea. In the words of the great Mrs. Doyle, It doesn't matter what day it is, Father. There's always time for a nice cup of tea. <laughs> sure didn't our Lord himself on the cross pause for a nice cup of tea before giving himself up for the world? So yeah, tea is kind of a big deal. And since it plays a key role in basically every social gathering, whoever you're meeting is going to give you a cup. Or three, whether you want it or not. <laughs> oh, no, no, thank you. <laughs> okay. And likewise, whoever is visiting you will also be force-fed copious amounts of this wonderful beverage. So it's very important to know how your friends take their tea. What brand do they like? There are only two correct answers, by the way. Do they like it strong or weak? Do they take sugar or are they pretending to be healthy again? Do they like a load of milk or just a drop or one of the many, many shades in between? In Ireland, a true sign of friendship is knowing how someone likes their tea. You know, one thing that amazes me about Jesus is how he invites us into friendship with him. He doesn't want just some robo-servants who do exactly what they're told, when they're told, without any understanding of why or the bigger picture. He wants friends, co-laborers to work with him, shining light into darkness and bringing hope to the hopeless. It's incredible to me that the creator of the entire universe wants to be friends with me. When I first met Jesus, I was so excited to be his friend and to deepen that friendship with him. But one thing was itching in the back of my mind. How could I call myself a friend of Jesus when I didn't even know how he liked his tea? So I had an idea. I started making cups of tea for Jesus to see if he would turn up and drink one with me. Now I know what you're thinking and yeah, maybe. But in my defense, I read these stories about how Jesus appeared to his friends to cook fish with them on the beach or broke bread with them. And I figured, hey, why not give it a try? So whenever I was alone in my apartment, I would make Jesus a cup of tea. I tried strong tea, weak tea, tea with sugar, tea without sugar, tea with loads of milk, tea with a drop of milk, tea after tea after tea after tea. But as you might expect, he never came to drink the tea. And to be completely honest, it was starting to annoy me. Eventually one afternoon, after throwing away yet another tea, I said, you know what, fine. I guess you just don't want me to know how you like your tea. And I proceeded to sit and sulk. You see, to me, it felt like Jesus didn't want to be friends with me and that he was only friends with, you know, more holy people. Like for example, Peter the guy who chopped off someone's ear and then denied Jesus three times. Or David, the guy who cheated on his wife with someone else's wife and then had that someone else killed so he could take that wife for himself. You know, those awesome fellas. I know, it doesn't make any sense, but when you're having a tantrum, you're not really thinking too clearly. So there I was, sulking away on my couch, when I heard a knock on the door.
As it turns out, it was just an international student who got locked out of their apartment and needed someone to wait for their landlord with a key. So I invited them in, and as is the custom, I offered them a cup of tea. But I didn't know them very well, so I had to ask them how they liked it. And as I was making it, as per their specifications, I felt the Holy Spirit tap on my heart. You know the way a friend might tap on your shoulder when they're trying to get your attention? And I heard Jesus say, that's how I like my tea. And I thought, what? You like your tea with a little bit of milk and no sugar? And then I heard Jesus laugh, and he reminded me of Matthew 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, you know, like, duh. But you see, to me, this was a complete revelation. I mean, it's crazy when you think about it. You can physically invite Jesus himself to lunch or buy him a new pair of shoes or even just make him a cup of tea. I mean, that's mad. I think that as Christians, we have a habit of over-spiritualizing certain things. We, we kind of associate his word with this feathery realm of ideals. And we forget how practical and down to earth his teachings really were, or really are. <laughs> it reminds me of this great old, or at least older movie called Walking Across Egypt. It's about this lovely elderly lady named Manny Rigsby, who's convicted by the words of Jesus in Matthew 25 to bring her famous pound cake to a teenage boy who's serving time in a juvenile detention center. Because well, in her words, I thought that maybe if I took a piece of cake to that boy, it would be like taking it to Jesus. Was it like taking a piece of cake to Jesus? I don't know, I never took food to Jesus. It's a really great movie, you should check it out. But what strikes me about it is what her daughter says when she's trying to persuade her mother to stop. The Bible says, we know what the Bible says. The Bible's full of wonderful stories, Mama. It is a monument to humanity. But that is all it is. It's just a storybook. You've already done plenty for him. You have done more than most would. Doesn't the Bible say when to stop? No. I think we can often unintentionally allow our minds to think of the Bible as just a book of wonderful stories. And then those thoughts kind of leak down into our actions and our lives. And it causes us to forget the power and the reality of Jesus' words. We look at the world as either physical or spiritual. And so tend to treat certain things as if they were only in a kind of fluffy spiritual world removed from our reality. But the truth is, you can right now invite Jesus to dinner, or welcome him as a stranger into your country, or visit him in hospital or prison, or, or even just make him a cup of tea. For years I had the idea, and to be honest, often still have the idea, that Jesus doesn't want to spend time with me as a friend. But I've come to realize that often it's just because I'm looking for him in the wrong places. It's like if a friend invited you to get coffee in the cafe across the street, and instead you, you go to the zoo and you wonder why he's not there. I think if you want to spend time with Jesus, try looking for him in the places that he likes to go or more importantly, with the people that he likes to hang out with. 
It doesn't have to be some grand elaborate form of charity. Like you don't have to go to Africa and build a school or something. You can start by just reaching out in your local community, but like making someone dinner or giving someone a kind word or even just making them a simple cup of tea. There's this really beautiful short story by Leo Tolstoy called Where Love Is, God Is, or sometimes Martin the Cobbler. It's about a shoemaker called Martin Ardvich, and he's led a really hard life. He loses his two eldest children when they were babies, and then he loses his wife in the birth of his youngest son, and then after a few years, even his youngest son. So he becomes quite bitter and, you know, stops going to church and rebukes God for taking his son away. One day, he's visited by a pilgrim who's on his way to a local monastery, and Martin tells him his story and explains in his sorrow that he just wants to die. The pilgrim comforts him and tells him that he can't live for his own happiness, and he should live for God, and he suggests that he buys and reads the Gospels to learn how. So Martin does just that. He buys the Gospels and reads them every night, growing closer to God and more hopeful and joyful every day. One night, He's reading Luke's gospel, and he reads about the Pharisee who invited Jesus to come and eat with him, and the woman who anointed Jesus' feet. He reads about how as the Pharisee is thinking badly of her, Jesus defends her, saying, Do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. As Martin reads this, he compares himself to the Pharisee and wonders how he would have acted if Jesus had come to visit him. That night, as he's falling asleep, he hears God tell him that he will visit him tomorrow. But he thinks, maybe it was just a dream. The next day, as he skeptically watches from his window for God, he sees an old man shoveling snow in the cold and invites him in for a warm cup of tea. A little while later, he sees a poor woman in the cold with a crying baby, and he invites them in for food and gives her some warmer clothes and some money. Towards the evening, he sees a young boy steal an apple from an old apple lady, but she grabs the little boy and tells him that she's gonna take him to the police. So Martin goes out and helps them to settle their argument, buying the apple for the little boy and telling him not to steal and explaining to the old woman the value of forgiveness. And he shows love and compassion to both of them. And they leave hand in hand with the little boy helping the old lady to carry her apples home. That evening, Martin wonders why God didn't come to visit him. But God speaks to him and asks why he didn't recognize him, showing Martin that each of the three groups of people that Martin had shown hospitality and love to were really him and explaining how in loving them, he was really loving God. And, well, let me read you the end. Martin's soul rejoiced. He crossed himself, put on his spectacles, and began to read the Gospels where it happened to open. On the upper part of the page he read, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. On the lower part of the page, he read this. Whatever you did for the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And Martin understood that his dream had not deceived him, that the Savior really did call on him that day, and that he really did receive him. Thanks for watching.